disclaimer, Brad Chester is not actually in this episode because he did not click play on his mic. Instead, you'll be enjoying the name Brad Chester anytime he was supposed to be talking. What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirits remain unbroken. I'm your host, the Boy King's father, Blake Law. This is episode 27 of the podcast, and we are very, very, very happy you're able to join us. They say we learn the most from our losses, and that is exactly what this podcast aims to do. We are interviewing elite players who lost one to two games at a major event. We are going to break down their mistakes and how they plan to learn from them moving forward. How often have you blamed a game on bad dice? I never do it. You should feel bad about doing it. I'm just kidding. We all do it. If you are hearing this message, I need your help. I am trapped in San Diego, and this is my SOS. The SoCal Open is actively holding me against my will. This time, we are on the flip side of the matchup. We're talking about the guy who Brandon Grant lost to. We are discussing the game that followed, the round six matches. Forces of the Hive, Mind versus Demons of Chaos. But first, let me address the elephant in the room. Steve Joel talked some serious smack on the Art of War Vanilla last week. It is absolutely talking about how I disrespected the original Art of War, and he is right. It is not the Art of War Vanilla. It is now the Art of War Kiwi Vanilla. Does that flavor sound good? I think it sounds delightful, and I'm going to be consuming it until I am sick. But when you stop to think about it, pistachio is still the best flavor. So think about that, Steve. Now, this is part one of the podcast. In this part, we'll be analyzing the game. We'll be talking about common mistakes, secondaries, target priority, all the good stuff that went into the game. Round six, SoCal Open. In part two, which is available to subscribers at theartofwar40k.com, we'll be going a little bit deeper. We'll be talking about the strategy adjustment that he plans to make, the list adjustment, We'll be talking about how he plays into combat-centric army, shooting army, how he plays into your army in part two. We'll also be talking about, and here's my used car salesman pitch, the elite player mindset. Patton, Blake Law. My co-host today has been so indoctrinated by my insanity-fueled intros, you may see him now mindlessly roaming and humming such jams as Islands in the Stream or maybe The Gambler. He's the winner of the Michigan GT He's a nine-time member of Team USA. He's won Adepticon 2012, as well as an infinite amount of other Adepticons. He has three top eight LVO finishes. He has won the Arms Forces GT this year. He's a 2021 ACO champion, runner-up at U.S. Series James Workshop New Orleans. He won studs and stotlings up in Canada, and now is the Prime Minister. He is currently sitting at number one in the ITC, Mr. Brad Chester. Brad Chester? Ah, uh, no. Um, actually, when Brad was taking a shower before we were start, uh, going down for, I think it was round four of the New Orleans Open, I put my phone outside the bathroom. I was playing Islands in the Stream just to get him mo- going, you know, get that mojo flowing. <laughs> it's me, Brad Chester. <laughs> uh, Brad, you're not going to Austin next weekend, and I don't like it. Why do you hate me? Brad Chester. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's in December, like December 4th or something. Nice, yeah. Okay, that's that's good. Okay. Our guest today is someone who has a track record that is very, very impressive recently. He was new to me when I commentated his games at Charity Hammer. He downed some of the biggest names in 40K and ended up with an impressive top eight finish at that event. He is the current number two player in the Forces of the Hive Mind in the ITC. He recently went 5-1 and one at the SoCal Open. Mr. Tyler Bortle. Uh, Bortel, howdy. Happy to, oh. happy to be here. <laughs> Of course. Brad Chester? You know, I'm pretty positive that I've said one person's name correctly in the last 10 episodes. <laughs> it's me, Brad Chester. I have. 
Brad Chester. <laughs> uh, well, hey, you got you got to throw it out there sometimes. You know, you got you got to come up with your own thing. Wow. I speak my own language. I'm from rural Arkansas, man. You know, we got our own uh, own dialect here. That's my excuse. Tyler, we're entering the holidays. What is the most Thanksgiving themed Warhammer 40k model? The most Thanksgiving themed Warhammer 40k model. Yep, I said it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's, pro- it's probably it's probably Big Bird. Um, he's definitely uh, a turkey walking around, not doing a whole lot, um, but he's just sort of has to be there. So that's very Thanksgiving. That was Brad Chester. <laughs> oh. You know, I, I threw that out there. I didn't know what I was going to get. Both those answers were very rapid and fantastic. So thank you. That was, I, I need nothing more. The, the, the question's done. Mm-hmm. Let's get into it. So we were talking about the SoCal Open for, I think, like the entire month of October and now going into November. So Tyler, tell us your thoughts on the SoCal Open. We've heard Brandon's thoughts. I think we heard um, Marshall's thoughts on it. What did, what, do you, what did you think about the SoCal Open? What did you think about the terrain? All that jazz. Yeah, I mean, over, overall, it's it's a fantastic event. It's one of FLG's premier events for a reason. Uh, the space, everyone seems to talk about it, is phenomenal. Um, so much room to get around your table is very nice. It's the terrain, we're using that pot, that player-optimized terrain that FLG loves so much. Um, it's really good stuff. Every table is fairly consistent. There's a couple of, uh, of notable flaws there. But overall, all that works out real well. Um, they've put a lot of, of intentional effort into their terrain in, I don't agree with some of the decisions that they've come to, but they've clearly thought about it, which I really appreciate. It's a lot more than many events these days can say. Um, and the TOing, the judging generally, generally went real well. Um, and we didn't have any BCP crashes. So overall, I'd say it was, a, it was a very well run event. Did you get any comments about your snazzy hat? Did you wear your snazzy hats for one? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I think I wore different hats on different days of the event. But um, people people are generally a, a fan of a guy in uh, in some good headgear. Yeah, well, well, a well, a well head, a well, what's the word? A well hatted man. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Brad Chester. <laughs> your Ohio booze, State actually. hat is older than I am, Brad. <laughs> Brad Chester. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get you a new hat for the next event, man. It's happening. You're going to swap it out. We're going to get you an Arkansas Razorback hat to get rid of that shameful. <laughs> it's me, Brad Chester. <laughs> Brad Chester? Seems about right. Seems about right. Tyler, what would you think about the player place terrain, and did it affect the way you built your army going in? Oh, absolutely. It's It's the best of the terrible systems, right? Like, I don't think there's a single terrain system out there right now that everyone's happy about. Um, either it's WTC and things are way too heavy to realistically run at, you know, independent events or, or, or a lot of the standardized stuff like the GW is super polarizing. It really forces certain builds. The player optimized terrain really allows a lot of flexibility in what you're trying to do. Whatever you want out of your table, you can sort of get it. Um, but it does end up leading to a lot of gaminess, a lot of, of weird interactions and some boards that don't always look the most reasonable or thematic. Also, they've still yet to sort of resolve the issue where quite often you'll end up with your last piece doesn't fit quite fit on the table and everything sort of gets bodged. It's never a fun situation, especially on a high intensity game. Um, so it's, it's still got some kinks to be worked out, but it is my favorite of the major systems that are out there right now. Was there anything in particular that when you're building your list where you're like, yeah, this is going in there because I have player place terrain. It allows me to take it. Uh, th- this list is, is pretty, is, th- this list is meant to be pretty versatile across terrains, particularly across bad terrain. So getting to have this much was very nice. Um, I definitely feel fully comfortable putting hive guard on the table and possibly putting more than one squad of hive guard on the table in the future uh, with, with a player optimized terrain for that reason. Mm-hmm. Brad Chester. For sure. So I'm running, uh, or well, was running, running a Forces of the Hive Mind uh, Triple Patrol. And of course, this is before the Octarius rules come out. Um, so this is going to be, uh, you know, old, old school stuff. Uh, so it's three patrols. The first patrol is of High Fleet Kronos. We've got a Neurothrope with Symbiostorm. That's your sixes or extra hit psychic power. Two squads of 10 Hormigaunts. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong thing. This is still true. Uh, two squads of 10 Hormigaunts. What is... 
Oh, there it is. Okay, apologies. Two squads of 10 Hormigaunts with uh, Adrenal Glands for that plus one advance and charge. Uh, fat, that squad of Hive Guard with Ignores AP2 and Elixir. And then we've got a Hive Fleet Jormungandr Patrol featuring a Hive Tyrant with Claws and Guns and the Resonance Barb. So he's casting three times at plus one, casting Smite, Psychic Scream, which is another Smite, and Catalyst for Feel No Pain. Troops in there, we've got the two squads of Tyranid Warriors with Lash Whips and Bone Swords and Adrenal Glands. Um, those lash bones got discussed on the Brandon episode, but um, there's some beautiful, beautiful, never leave home without them. And then 28 termagants with devourers, also with adrenal glands. Uh, and then our two fatty daddy barbed hero duels in all their one up save glory. Uh, and then last patrol is a cult of the four armed emperor or uh, gene stealer cults patrol. We got a magus with mass hypnosis and mind control. We got three squads of acolytes, one of seven, two of six, all, uh, what is that, 19 dudes with hand flamers. And then we got a Nexos for a little bit of CP regen and blip shenanigans on the back end. I want to say that I am very, very excited for this episode because we get to see the flip side of the Brandon Grant episode, which was two episodes ago. So we've never done this before. And I think it's going to be really cool to kind of see your mindset, having seen it from your opponent's mindset. So I'm, just, I'm very excited for this. <laughs> it's me, Brad Chester. <laughs> Grab Jester? Yeah, so this is round six, and uh, FLG decided that their nine round events should just run through the nine missions in order, which means this is the scouring, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, much maligned by a lot of people uh, for a number of reasons. The biggest of which, in my mind, is that it's terrible in events where you don't have um, a single undefeated as it almost always results in really lopsided games or really low-scoring games. If one person is scoring more than 70 points in the scouring, the other person is scoring basically zero. Um, so very often, if you're doing a battle points event where how many points you're getting is a really big deal, getting an even, even matchup where you're both scoring like 40 or 50 points in the scouring can really set you behind. Whereas in a more lopsided matchup, it's really easy to get a 97. Um, and I, I find that problematic. The mission itself for a one-off game isn't as terrible as people make it out to be, in my opinion, but it really sucks in, uh, in events with multiple undefeateds. Brad? Jester? Yeah, mine is sweeping clear, personally, but uh, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Oh, yeah, Battle Lines is awful. Brad, why don't you run down the demon list that Mr. Tyler here had to play round six? Brad Chester. With Brad not recording, I'm actually going to have to read the list out here. We have a Chaos Demon list, starting with a detachment of Bellacor, knowing all his powers. A Lord of Change, with all the impossible robe and the unkillable stuff that he comes with. A Poxbringer for troops in that detachment. We have a unit of three Nurglings, another unit of three Nurglings, and you got it, another third unit of three Nurglings. For Elites, we have a Solo Beast of Nurgle, Solo Beast of Nurgle. Very, very annoying. We have a second detachment here, this Slanesh, where we have not one, not two, but three Keepers of Freaking Secrets. For troops, we have a unit of 10 Demonettes, a unit of 10 Demonettes, and you got it, a third unit of 10 Demonettes. A unit of three Fiends rounds out the Elite section, and that is the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the sort of crazy thing going into this is, this is a rematch. I have played this guy before with basically this list at uh, a gt a couple weeks earlier um and he actually we played sweep and clear at that time which is an even worse mission for this setup i, I did just say it is also my least favorite mission in general and he ended up pulling out the win in that game but that was in large part due to the fact that we didn't play on a clock we only got through three turns um they didn't let us play into lunch and i would uh so the game state, it, it looked pretty in my favor, but we called it and we, we gave him the win. So I, I was feeling pretty confident knowing what I was going up against here, having seen this before. Um, I know sort of, of a lot of what it, it's capable of and what I have to do about it. But knowing that this is the scouring, I was very nervous. Starting 28 inches apart feels really good against basically a, a melee rush list. Um, but... Uh, he's plenty fast, and I don't really have any safe primary points. My list generally functions by completely denying my opponent's primary points. Over the course of the six games at SoCal, especially turns two and turn three, I gave up 15 total primary turn two, turn three, over the six games I played. Um, but I need to score some primary to actually capitalize on that. If no one scores primary, then I'm, we're just playing the secondary game, and that is not necessarily what 
hive mind are great at as we don't have faction secondaries yet. So we, we often struggle in that department. So what secondaries did y'all take? Speaking of that, uh, what did you take and what did your opponent take? Yeah, so generally walking up to a table, sort of without even thinking about it, I grab um, uh, Stranglehold, Retrieve Octarius Data, and then generally to the last. Uh, in this mission, I lo- or, uh, knowing, knowing what I know, that he has a lot of chaff units in all of his demonettes and his Beasts of Nurgle, uh, that I really wanted to be using my Acolytes to be spitting fire uh, more than I wanted them to be retrieving Octarius Data. And also looking at, at the mission, I wasn't, and sort of pre-envisioning how terrain was going to have to get set up, there weren't going to be safe spots to be sort of hanging out and retrieving Octarius data, and I can't advance and do it to get onto an objective. So I pulled Old Rod out, out and subbed it in for Assassinate because he's got five giant character monsters that are going to run straight for me, and if I don't kill at least a, hand, a good handful of those, there's not much of a game anyway, so it, it seemed like a natural choice. I did hold on to, to the last. Um, in our last game... I only lost one of my to the lasts, and it was in, a, in an avoidable sort of way. Um, so I felt that was a reasonable decision. Uh, I don't know that my play necessarily uh, acted like it was a reasonable decision, but I don't think that that was what cost me the game. What uh, What were your to the last in that list? My, my to the last are the two barbed hieroduels and the squad of hive guard. Oh yeah. Um, so basically, it becomes a question of can my durable damage dealers remain durable while dealing damage. Um, it's not a phenomenal secondary because the higher duels are going to be out in the open and if the wrong thing gets into combat with them, they'll definitely take a beating. Um, but between that and retrieve Octarius or his data, I felt like w- keeping one of the, of those three alive was all but guaranteed. There's a free five. I getting a third quadrant for Octarius was going to be a bit of a fight to get an eight as opposed to keeping a second unit alive for a 10. I, I sided with the, the to the last. Now, do you remember what your opponent took for secondaries? Um, he also took Stranglehold. I, oh, I had the score sheet. I don't know where it ended up. I don't think I have it anymore. But he definitely also took Stranglehold. Um, he also took to the last. His to the lasts were Bellacore, the Lord of Change, and one of his three Keepers of Secrets. And then his third secondary was Psychic Ritual. Nice. Okay, so he was he was playing on getting it, getting in some control in the middle of the board there, and just kind of doing his thing. Yeah. All right. So tell us kind of how the deployment uh, went on, and kind of what your thoughts were as far as priority against his army. Yeah. So I basically the 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 way that this game has to go is he has to throw everything that he has at me as far as those five big models are concerned as quickly as possible, and just sort of hope that I don't have the output to stop him or the speed bumps to slow him down enough to stop him in the process while I fight it for piddly bits and shenanigans. In my mind, the real game is happening on this periphery, right? He doesn't want his five big models to be standing around holding objectives. He wants them to be getting crammed down my throat. So while he's doing that, my acolytes and my devil gaunts and my hormigaunts and my warriors are fighting against his demonettes and his beasts of Nurgle uh, and his, and his Nurglings. Um, and that's sort of where a lot of the really important stuff is. And then there's a little bit of overlap as um, as he still has to go after my to the last and remove my damage, image output in the big guys, uh, and I'm still trying to prevent him from doing so. So that's sort of what's going on big picture there. Deployment-wise, um, we're playing on field base, which is one of the FLG terrain setups. And one of the big things about some of these terrain setups, in particular this one, is that there is a large... There are... There, first off, there is a ton of difficult ground. There are, I think it's, it's a, there, there are two massive forest bases, which aren't, they're not forests. One of them is a mechanical structure, so it provides light cover and dense cover and is difficult ground, which is, that's not actually a thing, but that's, those are the traits that it has. And the other one is dense cover and difficult ground and obscuring. So you get this extra giant forest that's minus one to hit if you cross through it, which is real bad news for Hive Guard, or at least it used to be. It was at the time. And Also, I can't see through it with direct line of sight shooting either, and he can still move through it. Now, whether whether or not uh, you can move monsters and vehicles through trees is a somewhat uh, contested discussion, but we both agreed that we would allow it um, simply uh, because the trees weren't mounted to the bases, so it would be impossible to decide what would be appropriate there. So we just pulled them entirely. Um, So his deployment is sort of everything is stacked up behind that forest, like right on his front line, and I've got my hive guard and a bunch of crap in the very back behind 
the sort of an L-shaped ruin that has been cornered there. And then we've both set up our, we have a small obscuring building and this one of these classic FLG foam hills that they just love so much. These four inch tall, like eight inch wide, three inch thick foam hills that are obscuring obstacles. Um, we each have a foam hill and a, and a bunker that are sort of covering our front objectives. So they can be held somewhat safely on our side of them. Uh, and then the middle is largely open. Uh, I've deployed a crate on it, uh, standing upright in the middle of the table with my first drop to prevent him from putting anything actually useful on that center objective. Because if he can hold that center objective without being seen, I'm in big trouble. Makes sense to me, yeah, because you definitely don't want him, if he's in the middle of the board and he's controlling it uh, and you can't do much about it, that's uh, that's basically game over because he's just going to sock a ritual and just control all those objectives right there. Brad? Jester? Yeah. So how did you how did you go into this matchup as far as like uh, turn one? What were you looking at taking down and kind of uh, what was your general thought on that? Yeah, so um, my uh, did I, I I went first if memory serves, and that's real bad. Or, or no, no, I went I went second. I did get to go second. Yeah, because I because I pulled a fifteen at the end of the game. I went second, which is great. Um, I should also mention all three of his keepers are random and them random on their exaltations and all three of them rolled minus one to wound in addition to something else uh which is the worst first, first one imaginable for me and i don't mean to say this is like oh man these dice are so bad i just mean to say this is something that i have to really think about going in because generally like it's kind of a kind of annoying for all my strength eight firepower but really what it kills is the devil guns who are doing most of the heavy lifting in this list just in every single game um well, and they go from wounding your keepers on fives, which then they have a, a four, a five up invul is the only save they have. They just evaporate to Devil Gaunt Fire. Now I'm wounding on sixes. We're talking about going from like eighteen wounds to like eight, and that's a very big difference. Um, yeah, it's huge in in what I can actually put out, and having no keeper targets available for that, I have to sort of change my usual plan a lot. Um, so he rushes forward or at me as fast as he can, basically, um, and I have to go up and start blocking stuff out. Uh, I send up Hormagons to block off the middle objective, score or off some stranglehold, and um, and uh, and keep him from getting in too tight. I've blipped him out fully uh, because he is somehow fast enough. I don't understand how fast keepers move, um, but apparently it's as far as he wants. Yeah, he he like he immediately picks up his keeper that has the plus two to move in advance or whatever. Rolls a six in its advance and just like picks it up and just sort of puts it in my deployment zone. I'm like, well, well, let's. We got blips here, like that's not going to work. But Jesus Christ, that was fast. Um, but so I, I bring in some some acolytes. It's as well with the, the hand flamers one squad with the intention to sort of try and take this objective from him early. Uh, and then the hormigons are going to move block the keeper from getting into them, hold the objective for stranglehold, and sort of move block him because the terrain is very narrow. He really he really should get bottlenecked if I play my cards correctly. And I immediately mess this up. Um, yeah, immediately mess this up. Yeah, I I have to pull casualties. Uh, or sorry, I guess I guess it's technically top of two that I messed this up. On top of two, I have to pull a bunch, a handful of casualties from smites and there's no guns in this list, so I guess it's just smites and psychic powers on my Hormagant squad. And I just like absent-mindedly, uh, the Hormagants are blocking sort of two channels, and there's a keeper behind each one of them, and I knock it down so I have one Hormagant blocking one channel and three blocking the other. Uh, and that's fine that they're way out of coherency uh, because I'm still fearless. I'm not going to go away until after the charge phase. He's not able to charge the juicy stuff behind it. And I just, like, he kills another one, and without even paying attention, I just sort of scoop the one that's out of coherency uh, and leave him open a channel. And I'm like, oh, no, that was so stupid. Oh, well, you know, it's a it's like a 10-inch charge. Like, it's not that big of a deal. He's not going to do that. Hopefully won't bite me in the tail too bad. Well, no, he hits the 10-inch charge because that's what I deserve for being so cocky. Uh, and wipes out an extra squad of acolytes and gets like eight x and gets ten extra inches of movement that I didn't need to offer him. So there's there's massive mistake number one. Um, so that's sort of going on. He's he's flooding in. Uh, my hive tyrant is sort of running up one of the flanks, and Bellacor comes over and just cuts him in half because Bellacor, that's what Bellacor does. He cuts things in half. Um, and I I have to retaliate, so I down it. One of the keepers goes down. Turn bottom of one. Uh, he warp surges it. It doesn't matter. I just have the output to put these things in the ground, even through minus one to wound. Um, so one keeper goes down, and I'm shenaniganing a little bit. Turn two, he rushes even harder. Uh, so 
Second big mistake, turn two, after he kills the Hive Tyrant, he piles in and consolidates cleverly such to, to come in and tag one of my hero duels. Um, and I'm not going to do anything to him in melee. I'm minus one to hit. Uh, I've only got four attacks. I'm not allowed to reroll my hit rolls. Um, I'm not minus one to wound, but he's still got a four up emblem. I have four attacks. It's just not going to do anything. But I, but I, you know, I try. I think I might have done maybe two wounds to him or something like that. Uh, and then on my turn, I make the incredibly cocky decision to not fall back, uh, believing that the psychic that I can can put there and the shooting uh, and keeping him tied up for an additional turn uh, is more valuable because it'll prevent him from wreaking some other sorts of havoc that, in hindsight, were just not realistic. So there's massive mistake number two. Uh, they end up fighting it, it out for a turn or so. Um, I'm showing up in weird places. This is, I've got acolytes killing uh, demonettes showing up outside of three inches. It leaves me this glorious little spot where I've got just enough toe in to drop acolytes and flame. And this is the big reason that I wasn't comfortable taking rod. I was totally right about that. Um, I needed every bit of fire that I could get my hands on to kill all these dang demonettes. Um, I have to allocate a lot of my firepower early on, on like turn two and turn three into nurglings and beasts of beasts, at least nurglings. I think I went up some beasts, maybe some demonettes um, because as much as all of my decent firepower would love to be killing these big bads, uh, killing big models does not score me nearly as many points as denying him primary does. So I end up spending like two activations of hive guard to get rid of a bunch of nurglings to hold him to very little primary. I think he may have scored 10 primary total over the course of the game. It is a hold two, hold three. So that's, uh, that's not that crazy. Um, but it's, uh, still definitely took a lot of my resources uh, closer sir, to the late game, I'm really trying to work down Bellacor. Bellacor is, he's, I don't know. I'm, I've never been particularly impressed by him. Every time I play against him, he seems to just sort of roll over. Um, he obviously has a ton of output, but for his points, like having, n- not having an armor save and just relying on making four up in bones and your couple of defensive modifiers doesn't seem sufficient to me. At the end of the game, he's sitting on one wound, uh, having made two out of two four-up end wounds on the last turn. That's how close he was to going down. Um, and uh, and if and him going down would have been another eight points in swing uh, between the five for to the last that he would lose and the three for assassinate that I would grab. Um, so it's really tight eight game. It's it's coming down to decisions like that, to leaving things in place a little bit too long. Uh, he ends, ends up having to make some really difficult decisions with his Keepers of Secrets, whether they're going to stay back and deal with acolytes on objectives or run forward and go after other things that they're more excited about. Um, and he ends up running forward and just sort of leaving objectives. And then the big swing at the end of the game that keeps me in it, at least, Devil Gaunts finally show up beh- actually in his backfield using Pheromone Trails uh, behind the forest. I always say with this list that um, I can't lose a game if the Devil Gaunts hit their charge. Um, you'll notice that every single Gribbly in this army has adrenal glands, which is one point per model for plus one advance and charge, which seems excessive. Um, but I, I often find it, especially on the Devil Gaunts, to be a really big deal, because if you can hit that eight inch with a reroll, the game usually just ends on the spot. Didn't get so lucky, lucky this time, but there's still 30 dudes with obsec sitting around that he has no way to deal with. So on turn five, they metabolic overdrive themselves and just coat the field and grab me a 15 on primary bottom five and a, and a one last stranglehold. So that's a pretty big turn. Um, but unfortunately it came up a little bit short and I end up losing, I think the final score is what? 55 to 45. So tight. <laughs> it's me, Brad Chester. 53, like nine, point. nine point Jeez. game. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Brad Chester. Yep. Yeah. So second, secondary wise, I end up with four, Five while we stands. He narrowly manages to kill both hero duels, but there's still two hive guard left alive at the end of the game. Um, like I said, leaving that hero duel in combat for an extra turn just gave Bellacor more activations than I needed to, um, which was the big mess up there. Um, and then Stranglehold was generally pretty successful. I think I scored, I think I scored twelve points on that, nine at the absolute worst. Um, and then assassinate wise, I killed keeper keeper um and uh his pox bringer um so i grabbed nine on assassinate uh and again billy is left at one wound couldn't quite get him down so across the board secondaries were reasonable 
the wall we stands or to the last weren't particularly effective, but the overall I, I wasn't crazy disappointed. You felt like that time when you fell back, I mean, that cost you probably five because you probably could have hit it if you didn't get hit by Bellacore again on a, on that activation, basically. Yeah. I, th- I think, I think that grabs me. I think that grabs me five points for sure. Um, Cause Bellacore just doesn't have time to kill both of the hero duels like he does. I will, I first? will say to, to Scott's credit, um, he only manages to kill the third hero duel um, by hitting a big advance on his last remaining keeper of secrets, who is then able to run over like all the way across the table far enough for Bellacore to get in uh, locus range to be allowed to advance and charge to make the charge into the final hero duel reasonable to then kill it. That was a very good move on his part. I got to get some for that. Yeah, it's really cool. What was the other mistake you had pointed out as kind of a pivotal point for you? Oh, the 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 maneuvering of the uh, Hormagons, yeah. Yeah, my, so. my, my Hormagon casualties get pulled. If you, it looks like nothing on stream, but it it's a it's a massive swing. Yeah, so that's that's an, an that's I I take like, a little bit of that philosophy. Like I said, I'm I'm putting a lot more into the Nurglings than anything else really early on. The problem that I run into is how quickly the keepers are able to force the issue. They're in combat turn two. Um, and my duels don't have a way to fall back and shoot, and they will go down if they sit in combat. So each turn, he basically gets to force one thing all the way down my throat, and I don't have much of a possibility there. Uh, I don't have much of an option at that point. Mm-hmm. Brad? Jester? Yeah, abs- absolutely. Uh, I will mention that two of the big guys don't give a give a give a don't 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 care at all um about my move blocking the lord of change and bellacore are going to be in my lines regardless um but yeah Mm -hmm. the uh he he kind of did it with a little bit of everyone and i shut that down pretty hard he only got it off two of the three times um because i've got minus one to cast i've got the denies i've got the uh the chrono stratagem to knock him down to 1d6 The, the other thing he i gotta I got a compliment on that he did really well because we are playing on a hammer and anvil style of deployment. And there is a lot of line of sight blockers. He kept the beasts really far back initially to screen in uh, zones, but also just to prevent them from getting shot at by a hive guard. And like none of my deep strikers are going to do anything to a beast. Um, And they end up being the thing that moves in and zones off deep strikers in the later game. But yeah, that's definitely, you're definitely right. That is the correct philosophy is deal with his objective holders first. Um, and just sort of hope we can avoid Eid, Eid dealing with the big guys for as long as possible. Uh, and I, I definitely I think he would be curious to try that matchup again, pushing that to its complete natural conclusion. I'll tell you, coming into the part two, we call it the Brad Hour or the Bradning, because you're about to experience what so many people have experienced before you, where Brad just goes blind and just hammers you with a bunch of random questions. So. <laughs> I just need to prepare you for that mentally right now because um, that's what's that's what's coming next, man. Is, uh, is the Brad name? <laughs> Looking forward to it, Brad Chester. Mm-hmm. That, that's what he does, man. I'm telling you, that's uh, Tyler. One of the things that we ask every guest who comes on the show is, how do you go about analyzing a loss? What is your mentality when you look at a loss? Like, say you're like eating dinner afterwards. What do you think about? How do you kind of break it down? Yeah, so I think I think analyzing a loss starts in game, and it starts in game with what you're not doing, which is that you're well. That's gonna I'm gonna walk in a circle here, but it's that you're not analyzing your loss in game. I got really upset when I pulled the when I pulled that those casualties wrong, or when I realized that that fallback move shouldn't have happened. But you have to immediately put that away. Like it's not it's not a helpful thought to have, especially day two, especially round six. Like you don't have the cerebral capacity to deal with that at the time, so that gets put away. Um, once, uh, once you're done, I'm done with the game and I, and I can see what the hell went wrong. I think it's really important to be just like, not, pers- don't, don't be charitable with yourself. It's not helpful to think ink, ink that, oh, well, you know, maybe if he hadn't hit that nine inch charge or, oh, well, you know, maybe if it be, uh, maybe this shouldn't have been that bad, you know, okay, maybe I had other priorities, like identify what went wrong and like, don't be afraid to beat yourself up about it a little bit. Like, you know, don't don't be mean to yourself. But um, but you've got to be you've got to be strict. And you've got to be exacting, and you've got to see where the points fall down. Oh, I will also say it's really important to to measure your points, the points that that you're missing here, right? That that Hormagon getting pulled in the wrong place is a big deal for like eight different reasons. 
uh, a big one is that it's five primary that I, I just completely pull away from myself by allowing him to get into stuff that he just shouldn't. Um, but it's also also allows him to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it also reduces my, um, my, uh, my total, total, uh, output. Yeah. My, my total damage output, put my, my, yeah. No, no, definitely not. Um, I think it's also so important, though, to analyze is sort of your your risk reward analyses and see, you know, is is there something thing better that I could have done? Is there something in that I should have done? And and even if it's not like an objectively better move given the circumstances, right? Like Brad just said, playing off the back foot is really hard in ninth edition. So you need to look at your game and say, okay, at what point in the game did I lose the ability to win? And ideally, that's at the very last dice roll at the very end of the game. But if you realize, oh, well, I lost the ability to win that game on turn three, or at least came close to it, what was I not doing turn four? How desperate could I have gotten? How scrappy can I uh, do? What can I bet on wild chances to get myself back into this? Because it's really easy, easy when you play really tight, really competitive 40K to stop thinking about winning and start thinking about, uh, I think Chuck Arnett calls this losing slowly, right? I can see that I'm down 25 points and I see a path to scoring 20 points. That's a useless path to me. I don't care or how many points I can score if it's not enough to win the game. Maybe it'd be under some circumstances that's not the case, but I am the bottom 5-0 and player or going into this because I play Tyranids. I don't score or that many points. And if I don't win this game, I'm out of the tournament. So if it's turn four, or, or, and I don't see a path, and the path that I'm taking is only a path to a narrow loss, that's not a helpful path. So every single, single thing had to get me closer to that. Um, you know, I needed, I needed it a dice. It, you basically, I mean, at some point you need dice is to bail you out. But if that's the only option, what is the best option where you have the best chance of that happening? Um, how do I how do I kill Bellacor? How do I how do I kill the Pox Springer? I was able to make that happen. That was a risky play to pull off. Happy that I that I made that happen. What charges wasn't I taking? What opportunities was I missing? I think uh, along those lines, when I brought in the Devil Guns, I brought them in turn three, and like I said, I ch- I double moved them on turn five. I think that I should have looked at that situation a little bit more carefully fully and wondered if there was like a realistic way that his like one keeper and a couple other resources that he could allocate could do sufficient damage to that squad of devil gaunts to keep me from getting that 15 in that stranglehold because if they can't and i'm double moving them turn four there's between there's at least i think there's at least eight points in there from a stranglehold that i missed because i missed stranglehold turn four a stranglehold that i missed and potentially some primary slash primary denial was is that worthwhile even if it might have meant that he kills me to the point that i can't score the 15 was there a path to win that didn't involve doing that and the only path that i see that i missed bellacor dies that's an eight point swing i lost the game by nine points bellacor dying doesn't mean jack right so i probably should have been taking that move and taking that risk because it was the only way forward um and that's the sort of thing that when you're on the clock you can't always necessarily really analyze in game but right. afterwards yeah. <laughs> it's me, Brad Chester. I'll take a 5% chance at a win over a 0% chance at a win every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tyler, we actually do a Q&A at the end of each part one. It's from the War Room members, which is part of our premium service with The Art of War. You can subscribe at theartofwar40k.com. We actually have three questions. 